On Wednesday nights, we've been going verse by verse through the New Testament book of Romans. And in the first five chapters of this book, Paul has really been hammering home his main point, which is that salvation is by faith and not by works. That salvation is about God's grace, not our ability to keep God's law. But Paul knows that these truths that he's been teaching could be easily misunderstood. And so in chapter 6, Paul stops to deal with an objection that he knew would pop up in people's minds. In fact, if this objection doesn't pop up in people's minds, then we're not preaching grace hard enough. And here's the objection. Well, if salvation is not about how good we are, then does it even matter how we live? If salvation is about God's grace, then does that mean that we can just keep on going living for sin? And Paul's answer is certainly not. Last week, we saw the first reason why we should no longer live for sin now that we have believed in Jesus. And that first reason is because we have died to our old way of living. Tonight, we'll see the second reason why we should no longer live for sin now that we've believed in Jesus. And that second reason is because we've been set free from sin, not to keep living for sin, but instead to start living for Jesus. And so look with me at Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 15. Paul asked the question, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? This is the main question of this chapter. Since we are now under grace, does that mean that we are free now to live a life of sin? Paul's answer begins at the end of verse 15. Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey? Whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Paul says that whenever we hand ourselves over to someone to obey them, that we become that person's slave. In Christ, we have been set free from sin. But when we keep habitually handing ourselves back over to some sin, then we end up being enslaved to it again. Now, you don't have to answer out loud, but have you ever gotten to that point? Have you ever gotten to the point in which you have given yourselves over to some sin over and over so many times that you end up being enslaved to it? Maybe we've handed ourselves over to pornography so many times that we're now enslaved to it. Maybe we've handed ourselves over to fornication so many times that we're now enslaved to it. Maybe we've handed ourselves over to drunkenness so many times that we're now enslaved to it. Maybe we've handed ourselves over to anger so many times that we're now enslaved to it. Maybe we've handed ourselves over to gluttony so many times that we are now enslaved to it. You see, we are so easily deceived when it comes to sin. When it comes to sin, we think that we are the master and that sin is our servant. But actually, sin ends up being the master, and we become its servant. We think that we are using sin to fulfill our desires, but actually, sin ends up using us to fulfill its desires. We think that we are the ones in control, but actually, sin ends up being the one in control. You see, sin always takes us further than we want it to go. Sin always keeps us longer than we wanted to say. Sin always costs us more than we wanted to pay. And sin always ends up hurting more people than we planned on hurting. What Paul wants us to do is he wants us to think about the consequences that come from handing ourselves over to be enslaved to sin. Not only does handing ourselves over to sin bring slavery, it also brings death. That's why Paul said that sin leads to death. Have you ever seen the kinds of death that sin can bring into our lives when we voluntarily enslave ourselves to it? 
For example, sin can bring physical death into our lives. Back in the Garden of Eden, God warned Adam and Eve that if they ate the forbidden fruit, then they would die. And when Adam and Eve sinned, the warning came true. Death entered into them and through them into the entire human race. And so the ultimate cause of all death is sin. But sin can also be the immediate cause of our death. Did you know that? If we enslave ourselves to adultery, then we might end up getting killed by our spouse or by their spouse. <laughs> like Paul says, sin leads to death. If we enslave ourselves to promiscuity, then we might end up dying from an STD. In fact, two and a half million people each year die from STDs. Like Paul said, sin leads to death. If we enslave ourselves to alcohol, then we might end up dying from the medical problems that are a result of, of enslaving ourselves to alcohol, or we might die from driving drunk. In fact, three million people a year die from having enslaved themselves to alcohol. Like Paul says, sin leads to death. If we enslave ourselves to gluttony, we might end up dying from all sorts of medical problems. In fact, four million people a year die from the effects of enslaving themselves to overeating. Like Paul says, sin leads to death. If we enslave ourselves to laziness, we might die from the negative effects on our health that come from a sedimentary lifestyle. Two million people each year die from the negative effects of physical inactivity. Like Paul said, sin leads to death. But there are other kinds of death that sin can bring into our lives besides just physical death. For example, sin can also bring death in our relationships. Have you ever seen sin bring death into someone's marriage? Have you ever seen sin bring death into someone's relationships with their kids? Have you ever seen sin bring death into someone's relationship with their parents or with their siblings or with their friends? Sin can also bring death to our intimacy with Christ. One of the worst things about enslaving ourselves again to sin is that it kills the close intimacy that we could have had with Jesus. Sin can also bring death to our ministry. Have you ever seen sin kill someone's ministry? Sin can bring death to a church. Have you ever seen sin kill a church? Sin can bring death to our witness. Have you ever seen sin kill someone's witness? Sin can bring death to our job or to our career. Have you ever seen sin get someone fired or even kill their career? Sin can even bring death to our dreams. Have you ever seen someone dream, someone's dreams die because of sin? I think now we're starting to see why Paul says that enslaving ourselves to sin leads to death. Now, we're, when we're in the moment of temptation, we don't think about that. When we're in the moment of the temptation, we're fooled into thinking that if we give into that sin, that it will make us feel so alive. But don't you believe that lie? Sin always brings death. Sin always kills something or someone in our life. Don't be fooled. Sin is a serial killer. Sin is a homicidal maniac. Sin is a slave master who always murders its slaves. And so the strong point that Paul's making in this passage is why would we enslave ourselves again to a master who wants to kill us? Look with me in the next verse, in Romans chapter 6, verse 17. Paul brings some good news, and in verse 17, he says, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Paul says, Thank God that when we submitted ourselves to Jesus, we were set free from having to be slaves of to sin. But Paul wants to make sure that we realize that we were not set free from sin to serve sin. We were set free from sin to serve Jesus. 
In fact, Paul says that instead of being slaves to sin, we have now become slaves to righteousness. Now, throughout this passage tonight, Paul is going to talk about how if we've believed in Jesus, then we've become slaves to righteousness, and even Paul talks about that we have become slaves to God. Now, I know that that can sound very offensive to our American ears, especially with the history that we've had in our country. Later in verse 19, Paul is going to say that I speak in human terms. What this means is that Paul knows that using slavery to talk about the Christian life is an imperfect and incomplete analogy. In other words, the slavery that we're familiar with is not a perfect picture of our relationship with God because the slavery that we're familiar with often involved degradation, dehumanization, fear, confinement, and abuse. And those things are obviously not part of what it means to be a slave to God. But the one point of comparison that Paul is trying to make is true. That when we give our life to Jesus, Jesus becomes our master and we become his servant. And so here's the question. How often do we think about Jesus this way? We often think about Jesus being our savior and praise God he is, but he is also our master. Over the last couple of decades, I got to hear Pastor Roger pray before Mills hundreds or, or probably thousands of times. And almost every single time when Pastor Roger prayed for his food, he would almost always begin by addressing God as master. He would say, Master, thank you for this food. How often do we think of Jesus that way? How often do we think of ourselves this way? When we think of ourselves, how often do we think about ourselves? Oh, I know who I am. I am a slave of Jesus Christ. Did you know that Paul thought of himself this way? In fact, this is how Paul introduced himself to the Romans back at the beginning of the book. Look with me again at Romans chapter 1, verse 1. These are the very first words of the book of Romans. And here is how Paul first introduced himself to the Romans. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Bond servant means slave. And so the first way Paul introduces himself to the Romans is he says, I'm Paul, I am a slave of Jesus Christ. Now I think even Christians can make the mistake of thinking that we are the master and that Jesus is is our servant. That Jesus is here to do what we want. That Jesus is kind of like our very own genie in a magic lamp. But we are not Jesus's master. He is ours. He's not here to do what we want. We are here to do what he wants. Look with me at verse 19 of Romans chapter 6. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. What Paul's saying in this complicated verse is he's saying in the same way that we used to give ourselves over to serving sin, we should now in the same way give ourselves over to serving God. In other words, we should pursue righteousness and holiness with at least the same level of passion that we used to pursue wickedness and filthiness. We should be as wholehearted about serving Jesus as we used to be about serving sin. We should be as enthusiastic about serving Jesus as we used to be about serving sin. We should be as all in when it comes to serving Jesus as we used to be when we were serving sin. One time there was a guy who got saved and he said this. He said, I want to be as good of a saint now as I was a sinner before. And I think that's what Paul's talking about. But far too often, 
We are less hardcore about serving Jesus now than we were about serving sin back then. Back then, we used to look at pornography for hours every single day. But now, we'll barely read our Bible for five minutes a week. Back then, we used to go to a party every single Saturday night without fail. But now, we won't even go to church every Sunday. Back then, we spent every second of every day dreaming about how we could serve sin more completely. But now, we hardly ever think about how we can serve God at all. Back then, we used to love to voluntarily pour out our money in the service of sin. But now, we hardly give anything to Jesus. Back then, we could name every type of drug on the street, every porn star on the internet, and all 52 kinds of genders. But now, we can't even name the books that are in the Bible. Now imagine, just imagine, if we were as dedicated now to Jesus' mission as we used to be to those missions that we had before. We used to be fanatics, fanatics for whatever it was that we served before Christ. Let me read to you something that was written by a true fanatic. This fanatic was a fanatic uh, of the communist cause. This was a communist writing about how dedicated they were to the communist cause. And I think you have this up on the screen. Here is what this communist wrote. We communists have a high casualty rate. We are the ones who get shot and hung and ridiculed and fired from our jobs and in every other way made as uncomfortable as possible. A certain percentage of us get killed or imprisoned. We live in virtual poverty. We give back to the party every penny we make above what is absolutely necessary to keep us alive. We communists do not have the time or the money for many movies or concerts or T-bone steaks or decent homes or new cars. We've been described as fanatics. We are fanatics. Our lives are dominated by one great overshadowing factor, the struggle for world communism. We have a cause to fight for, a definite purpose in life. There is one thing in which I am dead earnest about, and that is the communist cause. It is my life, my business, my religion, my hobby, my wife, my mistress, my bread and meat. I work at it in the daytime and dream of it at night. I cannot carry on a friendship, a love affair, or even a conversation without relating it to the force that both drives and guides my life. I evaluate people, looks, and actions according to how they affect the communist cause and by their attitude towards it. I have already been in jail for it, and if necessary, I'm ready to go before a firing squad. This communist was willing to enslave themselves to the communist cause and sacrifice everything because of their dedication to it. And so when we think about our past life, what cause would we substitute in the place of communism? What was the fanatical cause that we were living for before we believed in Jesus? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read that whole thing again. But this time, I'm gonna substitute the word Christianity in the place of communism. I'm gonna substitute our cause in the place of their cause. So let me read it again. I think I've got this version on the screen for you. Here we go. We Christians have a high casualty rate. We are the ones who get shot and hung and ridiculed and fired from our jobs and in every other way made as uncomfortable as possible. A certain percentage of us get killed or imprisoned. We live in virtual poverty. We give back to God every penny we make above what is absolutely necessary to keep us alive. We Christians do not have the time or the money for many movies or concerts or T-bone steaks or decent homes or new cars. We've been described as fanatics. We are fanatics. Our lives are dominated by one great overshadowing factor, to spread the message of Jesus Christ. We have a cause to fight for, a definite purpose in life. There is one thing in which I am dead earnest about, and that is Jesus. He is my life, my business, my religion, my hobby, my bread and meat. I work for him in the daytime and dream of him at night. I cannot carry on a friendship, a romantic relationship, or even a conversation without relating it to the force that both drives and guides my life. 
I evaluate people, looks, and actions according to how they affect the mission of Jesus and by their attitudes towards him. I have already been in jail for it, and if necessary, I am ready to go before a firing squad. Does that describe the level of commitment we have to serving Christ? Are we willing to dedicate our entire self to the Christian cause and sacrifice everything for it, like we did for the sin that we used to serve? Look with me in Romans chapter 6, verse 20. Paul says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. Paul says, Lost people think that they're free. In fact, that's one of the most common objections that we sometimes get when we're sharing our faith with people and talking to them about Jesus. People will often say, well, you know, I don't want to believe in Jesus because I want to continue to live free and enjoy my freedom. But Paul points out the sobering truth that if you're a slave to sin, you are not free. In fact, the only kind of freedom we used to have back when we were lost was freedom from living a better life. That's what Paul's talking about when he says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. You see, living for sin did not free us from authority. It only freed us from goodness. It only freed us from happiness. Living from sin only freed us from joy. And that's what people all around us are so dying to be free of, right? I mean, when we were enslaved to sin, the only kind of freedom we really had back then was the freedom to destroy ourselves the freedom to make ourselves miserable, the freedom to miss out on the good life. And so what Paul's pointing out is that kind of freedom that people say they don't want to forfeit to believe in Jesus is not really even freedom at all. That kind of freedom is actually slavery in disguise. Look at me in verse 21. Paul challenges us again. He says, what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Paul here asked a very pointed and very practical question, and here it is. What fruit did you have back then? In other words, Paul's challenging us to ask ourselves, was it really so good back then when we used to be a slave to sin? What good did all that sin get you? What good did that sin produce in your lives? And the answer is, None. Nothing good. That life of sin only produced rotten fruit. And so what Paul is saying is those things that we're tempted to go back to from our old life are the very same things that we are now ashamed of, that we're now embarrassed about. I mean, let me ask you, you don't have to answer out loud. Are you ashamed of the things that you did before you believed in Jesus? I know I am. I am so ashamed of how I used to live, how I used to talk, how I used to hurt people. And so Paul's point is, why would we want to go back to that? Why would we want to enslave ourselves again to the old things that we are now ashamed of? But Paul also wants to think about the flip side of the equation. He wants us to think not just about the fruit that comes from serving sin, but also to think about the fruit that comes from serving righteousness. Look at me in verse 22. Paul says, But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. Paul wants us to think about how much better our life is now that we have become servants of Jesus. Have there been any good things that Jesus has brought into your life since he's become your master? Jesus has brought so many good things into my life since he became my master. When Jesus became my master, he brought with him joy and peace and purpose. There are friends that I would not have if Jesus had not become my master. There are family members I would not have if Jesus had not become my master. I wouldn't have my wife if Jesus had not become my master. I wouldn't have my kids if Jesus had not become my master. I wouldn't have my job if Jesus had not become my master. You see, we all have a decision to make, and here it is. We can serve sin, 
a cruel master who only wants to hurt us and kill us, or we can serve Jesus, a kind master who only wants to help us. And did you know that those are the only two options in life? Look with me in verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here, Paul puts us squarely face to face with a clear choice. And there are only two options, death or life. Now notice that the death that comes from sin is referred to as wages, but the life that comes from Jesus is referred to as a free gift. Look with me again at verse 23. Paul says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me ask you, what is the difference between receiving wages and receiving a free gift? The difference is that wages are something you have to earn by working for them, but a free gift is something that someone gives you simply because they love you. Now, most of the world, when they think about eternal life, they think about eternal life in terms of wages. That if we work really hard in this life, and that if we clock in enough hours, then we can earn our own salvation, and then God will owe us the paycheck of eternal life for a job well done. But this verse says that the only thing we've earned in life is death. And that's why the Bible says that eternal life is not a wage that we have to work for. It's a free gift that we have to receive. And how do we receive it? By faith. For example, let's say my grandma buys me a gift. How much money did I pay for that gift? None, right? It's not a trick question. Don't worry. None. That's the definition of a gift. That's why it's called a gift because I didn't pay for it. My grandma loves me. So my grandma paid for it so that I could have it for free. In the same way, salvation is a free gift. We don't pay for it by our good works because Jesus already paid for it with his own blood on the cross. And he paid for it so that we could have salvation for free. So here's the big question. Have you received the free gift of eternal life? Have you put your faith in Jesus? If not, then I want to beg you, do not wait another moment to make the most important decision of your life. I want to beg you, please choose life over death. Please choose Jesus over sin. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for all the words of the Bible. God, we thank you for the warm, fuzzy, encouraging words. Lord, we thank you for the pointed and challenging words because, God, we need both. Lord, I thank you for the challenge that the Apostle Paul has laid down through the inspiration of your Holy Spirit to help us realize that it makes no sense to enslave ourselves again into the sin that we have been set free from. Thank you, God, for this reminder that we have now become your slaves and that we should live as passionately for you as we used to live for sin. And so, God, I pray for all of us, Lord, that we will hand ourselves over completely to you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.